Well, welcome to Louisville. As a resident, I'd like to uh, extend an invitation to get out and enjoy some of the sights and the interesting things to do around town. But I'm also going to give you a more in-depth look at some of the things that happen in our city. Here in Louisville, we typically have two days a year designated as junk pickup days. These days are reserved for people to put things out to the curb that trash collectors normally won't pick up. Now, a week before the scheduled pickup date, people begin piling their, their stuff that they no longer want at the end of their driveways. And if you drive throughout various neighborhoods, you can get a good idea of what people value or what they used to value. I've seen all kinds of things. Couches and chairs, ping pong tables, patio tables, broken mirrors, bookcases, televisions, car tires, and so much more. Now most of this stuff is worn out or broken in some way, but if you're lucky, you might just find a great piece of treasure. You might think I'm kidding, but for the week leading up, to the junk pickup, you'll see numerous people driving around the neighborhoods in their cars and trucks going through this garbage. As I'm outside doing yard work, I'll notice pickup trucks driving down our street that are so loaded down with junk that it's tied to the side of the truck bed. Cars so full that the driver has to hang his head out the window so he can see. Like the saying goes, one person's trash is another man's treasure. Now, I'm not one to sneeze at getting free stuff, but for me, picking through someone else's garbage, it's not worth the item sought. But it is interesting to think about what may come of the garbage that people take home with them. Does the new owner take the stuff home and immediately set to work, trying to restore it and bring it back to good working order? Or does it sit in a pile in their yard getting rained on and gradually rusting, rotting, or molding? You may be thinking that I'm reaching here as I try to equate garbage with treasure, but there is a connection. To these collectors, this is treasure. As they pass by a house, there was something in a pile that caught their attention, and the desire to have it grew inside them. My aunt and uncle used to have a newspaper route in some of the swanky areas around Cincinnati. They were always going through people's garbage and bringing stuff home. They called it being thrifty and being resourceful. One day, my aunt saw this beautiful white wicker rocking chair sitting near some garbage cans. She didn't have room to get it at the time, but she decided that when she finished delivering the newspapers, she'd go back and get it. When she returned, it was gone. She went home and told my uncle about the chair, but then said, you know, I went back to get it and somebody else had gotten it. Then my uncle took her into the living room to show her the chair that he had found, a white wicker rocking chair. May we be reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me ask, what do you cherish? What do you deem valuable? What's your treasure? Is your treasure garbage? I don't mean an old tattered computer chair or a two-legged bar stool. Is your treasure money, attention, clothes, looks? And these are only a fraction of the places that, that we can a assign value, sometimes too much value. You see, treasure represents the ultimate expression of one's person. When we allow our hearts to be our control centers, they influence our desires. And those empty areas of money, attention, and social status, and so on, can be where our heart leads us. When our heart is exposed to earthly enticements, it's tarnished. In Jeremiah 17, 9, God says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Sin has a funny way of keeping us from seeking the good stuff, the treasure that will last. A sin-filled heart is going to keep leading us in the wrong direction. A lot of people try diets. The problem with maintaining 
a successful diet begins with the overabundance of fast food choices that make eating quick and cheap. This kind of food has addictive properties that, that cause us to crave it, especially if we're on a diet and trying to quit. But after you've been away from fast food for so long, the cravings stop and it isn't appealing anymore. Former Newsboys band member Phil Joel once wrote an article about how easy it can be to be tempted to feed on the junk food of our culture. Watching the wrong kind of TV, viewing the wrong internet sites, seeking fame and recognition even within our own social networks. These can create addictive properties that cause us to crave these things. Before we realize that we've invested too much time and put too much value into this kind of junk food. But by removing ourselves from the influence of worldly junk food, and most importantly, by feeding on the bread of life, the cravings and addictions can stop. During the week-long academy preaching camp this past summer, God laid a heavy question on my heart. Where have you invested your heart? I know I need an occasional wake-up call to ground me, and this was one of those times. Where have I invested my heart? The reason this question weighs so heavily on me is because a person with a misplaced heart and a misdirected mind also suffers from a misguided will, a will that's not in line with God's will. Here's my problem. I am prone to wandering from God's will. Some of my treasures are still the ones that God, that Jesus says, they're not worth anything in my kingdom. For instance, I used to collect baseball cards as a kid. I got curious one day about how many I had, and I decided to count them. It was somewhere around 23,000, and that didn't include duplicate cards. I have autographed baseball cards, signed baseballs and t-shirts, and other fascinating sports memorabilia. And I'm very particular about how to handle and, and the condition of my prized possessions. But if I'm not careful, my collection can become something I place more value on than seeking the kingdom of God. Whether it's playing, coaching, or watching sports, or collecting memorabilia, I tend to give those areas too much value. I place too much value in other areas, too, like what people think of me. Many times I place too much value in academics and not enough in relationships. Matthew 19, verses 16 to 20, records an interaction Jesus had with a rich young man. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? the man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. This young man wanted what Jesus was offering, eternal life. He knew that Jesus could tell him how to get it. Jesus told him, follow the commandments. And the man said that he does. But then he asks, what do I still lack? He still didn't feel right. Somewhere inside of him, he knew there was something else. I often wonder if we're the same way. We know Jesus is the only way to eternal life, but do we frequently find ourselves feeling lost and empty like this young man? Do we put so much stock in empty earthly gains that we lose our focus? Jesus is not commanding that everyone go and sell their possessions, but we need to put ourselves in the rich man's shoes. If Jesus told us to sell our treasures, could we do it? What are your misplaced treasures? There is something positive in all this. Jesus speaks of a heavenly treasure where no man can take it and no element can deteriorate it. 
How do we obtain this treasure? When I first got a job, I knew I needed to begin tithing. I'd recently heard a sermon on how giving money for God's work is like making a spiritual investment that we can cash out when we get to heaven. What I've realized since then, in addition to tithing, we can make these investments in other ways. Like what? Serving as a big brother or big sister. Visiting those in the hospital or confined to the home. Volunteering in a nursing home. Donating clothing or other material goods taking care of those who have a hard time caring for themselves. It is through our obedience toward God, doing his will, which allows us to continue storing up spiritual treasures. We all desire to obey God and to remain in line with his will, but the powers of evil don't make it easy. We may not be tempted to murder, but we may be tempted to get angry and hate. We may not be tempted to deceive and steal, but we may be tempted to color the truth. Everywhere we turn, there's a chance we might see advertisements for shows or movies that are not family friendly. We might see images that slowly cause us to think sinful thoughts, which manifest as sinful behavior. Music we listen to, people we interact with, all these things can produce negative influences that distract us from the, from the true purpose of doing God's will. Our enemy's plan to destroy us may not hinge on major sins. It may revolve around countless distractions, things that seem innocent or even good that keep our minds off God long enough that we begin to blend in with the culture. So how do we keep from being lured away from God's purpose for our lives? Colossians 3 maps this out for us. Listen to these powerful words that Paul wrote. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. The things of this earth are not worthy of being compared to the things of God. The hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, was penned in 1918 by a 55-year-old blind woman named Helen Lemmel. Its words are gripping and true as she reminds us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. And when we focus on him, when we set our eyes on the heavenly things, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Do you understand? In comparison to the good things God can give us, the treasure we value so much will begin to look as it really is, like garbage. But it doesn't stop here. In verse 5 of Colossians, Paul tells us what we have to do. Put to death anything belonging to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. This list is some of the spiritual garbage we see on the side of the road and stop to sift through. How often do we allow ourselves to be exposed to this toxic garbage? My guess is, too often. I fall short of God's glory every day. I know I deserve something other than heavenly treasures, but my God is a loving God. My God is a merciful God. My God is a forgiving God. And my God has given me grace. That grace is not a license to sin, but it does provide a redo for when we mess up and we lose focus of what is truly valuable. As we go forth from this place, I would like to encourage each of us, as we travel on the metaphorical road to the pearly gates, to keep our eyes on the heavenly prize. Let's look to our divine pilot to help us stay the course, to keep us from stopping along the roadside, to pick up spiritual garbage that we mistake as treasure.